Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to start reading through this book, The Animal Atlas, The World's Wildlife as You've Never Seen It Before. It's a really neat book. It's got lots of um, maps in it that show where some animals live in the world. So tonight, if I can get to the table of contents, we're going to read this first chapter about invertebrates. So in warning, there is a page about tarantulas in here, so um, I will warn you, we'll see this picture of a bee first, and you might want to exit the video at that point or just darken your screen. I totally get it because sometimes pictures of spiders upset me too. I know they did when I was really young, so apologies for that. But before we get into the maps, Let's start off with some invertebrate facts. Let's see. Tiny animals without backbones first appeared more than 600 million years ago. These early invertebrates lived in water, and many still do. Today, the diversity of invertebrates found throughout the world is staggering, from squids and starfish to worms and spiders. Here are some types of invertebrates. There are around 35 main groups of species in the animal kingdom. Just one of these groups, the vertebrates, contains all the fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. The other 34 groups are invertebrates, animals without an internal jointed skeleton. Six of the main invertebrate groups are shown here. First is sponges. These primitive ocean organisms cannot move and gather food by filtering it from the water. Um, cynodarians. I'm sure that's not how you say that, but it's these guys. From jellyfish and anemones to corals, these sea creatures all have stinging tentacles to catch small prey. Echidnoderms. With their spiny skin, these marine animals include starfish, sea cucumbers, and sea urchins. Mollusks. From slugs to squids, mollusks live in damp habitats or in the sea. Many have a hard shell. Worms. Found in water and on land, some, such as earthworms, are made up of many identical soft-skinned segments. And anthropods. With their tough outer skeletons and jointed legs, anthropods include insects, spiders, and crabs. And down here there's a little fact that says almost 97% of all animals are invertebrates. A little chart up here, invertebrate numbers. There are approximately 1.3 million known invertebrate species, but there could be many millions more. The vast majority of invertebrates belong to two groups, anthropods and mollusks. So 85% of invertebrates are anthropods, like this grasshopper. Anthropods make up the majority of invertebrates grasshoppers and scorpions to lobsters and prawns. Big or small, on land or underwater, these armored animals move easily thanks to flexible joints in their legs. And 10% are others. Other invertebrate groups include echidnoderms such as sea urchins and starfish, cynodarians such as jellyfish and anemones, and lots of different worms, including earthworms, roundworms, and parasitic tapeworms. And then 5% are mollusks, like this big octopus. Mollusks are a diverse-looking group of creatures, from garden snails to octopuses and oysters. Nearly one quarter of all sea-dwelling animals are mollusks. Extreme habitat. Some invertebrates can withstand and even thrive in incredibly hostile conditions, from barren, icy Antarctica to vast, unexplored regions thousands of feet below the Earth's surface. So here are an Antarctic midge, 
which are gross, but they're literally Antarctic midges are insects that measure only three-eighths of an inch or one centimeter, yet are the largest native land animal in Antarctica. They live at temperatures of 5 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 15 degrees Celsius, spending nine months of the year frozen solid. And here are the tube worms. Tube worms, a type of marine segmented worm, live on the Pacific Ocean seafloor near hydrothermal vents, volcanic areas where sections of the Earth's crust are moving apart. They grow up to 10 feet or 3 meters. Let's look at some body shapes up here. It says invertebrate body shapes fall into three main categories based on symmetry. There's bilateral symmetry. Many insects, from ladybugs to butterflies, have two halves that mirror each other. There's radial symmetry. Invertebrates such as starfish have several lines of symmetry around a central point. Or no symmetry. Invertebrates like sponges have no lines of symmetry. They have irregular body shapes. Let's see the smart octopus. I think they're so cute. Anyway, the coconut octopus uses tools such as discarded coconuts or clamshells to hide in while watching for prey such as crabs. Living, I'm sorry, living on sandy bottoms and bays or lagoons in the western Pacific Ocean, this clever creature, which extends to about 6 inches or 15 centimeters, is also able to pick up and carry these tools more than 66 feet or 20 meters. Got distracted, my cat's drinking his water over there. Anyway, the biggest invertebrate is the colossal squid. Look at its size of one, two, three, four, five, six people. Colossal squids live in the southern ocean and can reach 40 feet, 12 meters long. The smallest invertebrate is the rotifer. There's a rotifer, and it's that's a human hair magnified, so there they are. Rotifers are among the world's smallest animals at 0.001 inches or 0 0.05 millimeters long. The fastest insect. The fastest insect relative to its body size is the tiger beetle. This half inch or 1.4 centimeter long animal covers 120 times its body length in just a single second. It says Usain Bolt's can do five body lengths in a second, and the tiger beetle can do 120 body lengths in a second. It temporarily goes blind from the speed. The highest jumper, the tiny frog hopper, can leap more than 23 inches or 60 centimeters in the air. That's the equivalent of a human jumping 630 feet or 190 meters or a 40-story building. Let's see. Oh, we got a spider. I do apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry. The Mount Everest jumping spider lives up to 22,000 feet or 6,700 meters above sea level on the slopes of Mount Everest. Well, I guess I'm never going to Mount Everest. <laughs> I don't like spiders and I especially hate jumping spiders. Yuck. The longest migration. The globe skimmer dragonfly migrates 4,400 miles or 7,080 kilometers through the air without landing. And the biggest swarm. The desert locust gathers in swarms of up to 8 billion. Living in parts of the Middle East, Asia, and Africa, they are known to destroy crops. Let's get into some animal maps. I'm going to start off with the giant Pacific octopus. You can see we're in this region up here in the world. Weighing as much as two grown men, the giant Pacific octopus is the largest of all octopus species and one of the biggest ocean predators without a backbone. It is an agile, intelligent hunter capable of catching prey as big as sharks. So let's look at the little boxes first and then we'll check out the map. Alright, I had to readjust my desk so I could slide this book around a little more. 
Anyway, let's start off with the boxes first. So it says moves and tricks. Giant Pacific octopuses crawl or glide across the seabed, but for a quick getaway, they push water from inside their body out through a funnel to create jet propulsion. They do not have many predators, but if threatened, they squirt out ink to confuse their attackers below. Um, I guess this is the ink down here. I'm not sure. Anyway, let's see up here. Cold Water Hunter. Big, speedy predator, the giant Pacific octopus thrives in the cold, oxygen-rich waters around the northern rim of the Pacific Ocean, mostly in seas that are rarely deeper than 1,640 feet or 500 meters. The octopus grabs prey with its arms, then uses its beak to inject venom into the prey. This immobilizes the prey and softens its flesh, which the octopus then can lick out with its rasping tongue. And here's an, looks like a little octopus garden, right? Octopus nursery. Each female octopus lays up to 100,000 eggs in an underwater cave or crevice. She guards the eggs, which hang in clutches until they hatch about six months later and she dies. The tiny hatchlings then spend about two months drifting among the ocean's plankton before descending to the seabed, where they develop into adult shape and size. Let's check out the map here. Down here in Japan, you can see all the purple area here is where they live. So it says clever fishing. Giant octopuses in Japanese waters have been fitted with radio transmitters to follow their movements. Many have been found to follow commercial fishing nets to steal a meal. But here it says food train. Food chain trouble. The Sea of Okhotsk is rich in the food the giant octopus eats, such as fish, shellfish, and crabs. But as climate change causes ocean waters to warm up, the food sources on which the octopus depends are put at risk. Let's go over here to see in deeper waters. In summer, giant octopuses migrate into deeper offshore waters to mate, sometimes reaching down to 4,900 feet or 1,500 meters. In fall, they return to the coast where females lay their eggs. Up here by Alaska, northern range. Furthest north, most giant octopuses live in shallower waters. Many live in coastal reefs, and some may even drift into the in intertidal zone by the shore. They're heading over here to where I live over here. It says accidental catch. In the rich fishing waters off the northeast Pacific, giant Pacific octopuses risk being caught in nets cast for cod and flatfish. It is the octopus species most commonly landed as a bycatch here. And the rest to talk about the octopus's body here. The fleshy body. The thick, wrinkly skin of a giant Pacific octopus covers a soft, fleshy body that can squeeze through the smallest gaps. This is useful for catching prey hiding in crevices or escaping enemies on a rocky reef. And strong arms. Octopuses have eight arms that carry two rows of large suckers for gripping prey. Each arm can have more than 500 suckers in total. And our little fact at the end, a giant Pacific octopus can weigh 400 pounds or 180 kilograms, and its long arms can span up to 20 feet, or 6 meters. Oh boy, that's pretty long. The European lobster is next. Lobsters are crustaceans. A group of invertebrates with armor-like jointed exoskeletons protecting their soft bodies. One of the largest lobster species, the European lobster, lives in shallow coastal seas across most of Europe and northern Africa. Let's look at the boxes first. It says lobster movements. Most lobsters migrate into deeper waters to spawn, but one of the most spectacular migrations happens every fall off the coast of the United States, when huge numbers of spiny lobsters move in single file over the seabed to reach their spawning grounds. 
they go very orderly. There's another box up here. It says life on the seabed. A lobster needs water to help support its weighty body, which is far too heavy for the lobster to move around on rocky shores or beaches. Lobsters mostly crawl across the seabed, where they live in crevices or burrows. When needed, they escape by quickly swimming backwards. Even a big lobster might be swept away by strong currents in deeper water, so they don't go too far offshore. Big, big lobsters. Why don't we look at its little body facts first? Because this talks about its long antennae. Lobsters use their antennae to feel their way around on the seabed in murky, dark waters. And their uneven-sized claw the fatter claw of a lobster is stronger for slow crushing, while the slimmer one is better for faster cutting. Both are used for breaking up food or in self-defense. Now, I always wondered why, like, some crustaceans have one big claw. That's why. Let's check out the map. We're going to start over here in the Azores. This group of small volcanic islands marks the westernmost point of the European lobster's territory. Let's go up here to the North Sea. It's a little lobster. The North Sea is the biggest expanse of shallow continental waters in the Northeast Atlantic. It is rich in lobsters' as favorite food, such as crabs, starfish, and sea urchins. And up here in the Norwegian Sea, it says warm ocean currents flowing up from the tropical Atlantic into the Norwegian Sea help keep waters ice-free, so lobsters live as far north as the Arctic Circle. Incredible. Down here to some warmer waters. Like many European marine species, the European lobster reaches the southern limits of its range in the waters off the coast of Morocco in northwest Africa. It cannot tolerate the warmer tropical seas further south. Let's go into the Mediterranean. The salty environment. A warm climate evaporates water from the Mediterranean Sea and makes it slightly saltier than the Atlantic Ocean. Lobsters can take these conditions and range widely across this region. And over here in the eastern Mediterranean, it says, the Mediterranean Sea reaches a depth of over 16,400 feet or 5,000 meters in the middle. Lobsters keep to shallower coastal waters ranging as far east as the Greek island of Crete. And up here we're in the Black Sea. Rivers flowing into the cool Black Sea make it less salty than the ocean. European lobsters can survive here, but in fewer numbers and only in western areas. Looks like they go through the Bosphorus here, to the Black Sea. I skipped a little fact up here. It says coastal crustacean. Like many other marine animals, the European lobster stays mainly in coastal seas. Lobsters are fished for food, but despite some local overfishing, especially in the North Sea, the overall population is stable. Let's see the little facts down here. Female European lobsters can live up to the age of 70. And it says, let me slide this over so you can see, overfishing in the North Sea has made lobster numbers there drop by 90%. But apparently it's stable, so not a terrible thing, apparently. Next, we're going to look at the postman butterfly. Postman butterfly lives in varied habitats from Central to South America. Across its range, its exact pattern of red, black, and white varies from place to place. A flash of color from any postman butterfly is a sign that it is poisonous, so it helps keep predatory birds away. Let's see the boxes first. Oh, there it is as a caterpillar. This caterpillar diet. Postman butterflies become poisonous very early in their life. These caterpillars eat leaves of passion vines, which contain toxic cyanide. The 
poison stays in their bodies without harming them, even as they turn into butterflies. Adults also may feed on passion vines, but on the nectar and pollen of its flowers. Little fact down here about the regional colors. Some species of butterfly may have many different varieties according to where they live. The postman butterfly, for example, has more than 20 variations. Some of these are shown on this map in the areas where they live. You can see, huh, this one's got two spots. This one's got one. This one has them down here. This one's got like the stripe. That's neat. I like that. This one doesn't have any spots. Let's read this last box about the master mimics. Closely related to the postman butterfly, the red postman is a separate species, but matches the local color pattern of the postman wherever it lives alongside it. As they are both poisonous, the mimicry reinforces the warning for potential predators and helps both species survive. Let's look at its little anatomy here about its wing pattern. The colors of the postman butterfly come from tiny pigmented scales that cover the surface of the two pairs of wings. Its wingspan can measure up to 3 inches, or 7.5 centimeters. And let's look at the map, starting over here in Central America. In the rainforests from Guatemala to Panama, postman butterflies have red bands on their forewings and white bands, sometimes tinged with yellow, on their hind wings. So interesting. Up here in the Andes, high up in the mountain valleys and foothills of the northern Andes range, the butterflies' hind wings have less white. Some have no white in their pattern at all. Then up here in the Guiana Highlands, in this area of tabletop mountains rising steeply from rainforests, the butterflies have little or no white in their color pattern, similar to those of the Andean mountains. To the Amazon Basin, all this over here. Across the lowlands of the Great Amazon River Basin, local postman butterflies often live along rivers and streams. Here they have white patches on their forewings, sometimes broken into spots. And up here, on the coast of Brazil here, it says wings at rest. Like most day-flying butterflies, postman butterflies rest with their wings raised so their tips almost touch. Flapping their wings helps spread a scent that deters predators. And up here in the wetlands, it says in Brazil's Pantanal wetlands, the postman lives near water. Here it has white stripes on the, on the hind wings, looking more like those along Brazil's southwest coast and in Central America. And that's so interesting, all the little varieties. And down here we can see it, sucking nectar. Butterflies have a flexible tube called a proboscis for drinking liquid nectar from flowers. Usually kept coiled up, it unrolls when the butterfly is ready to feed. Like a little straw. Drink from the passion flower. Let's see the fact down here says there are about 20,000 species of butterfly in the world, and at night, postman butterflies gather to sleep in groups known as communal roosts. Interesting. They sleep cuddled up together like that. All right. Here's a big old honeybee. It says plant pollinator. Bees are essential for keeping our planet green. They transfer pollen from flower to flower pollinating many crops that we depend on for food. The mining bee is busy harvesting pollen from an apple blossom tree in Wisconsin. But climate change is affecting bee behavior. Bee behavior. And intensive farming and pesticides are destroying bee habitats, such as wildflower meadows, trees, and hedgerows. So this is your warning. There's the tarantula page coming up after this big sweet bee. So, um... You can exit the video if it's too much, or just darken your screen, or whatever suits you. Or just watch, because it's kind of an interesting page. Because I'm not a spidery person myself, but I think these facts are pretty neat. Let's read about tarantulas. 
Many big spiders are called tarantulas, but all true tarantulas have fat, hairy bodies and belong to a family called the theraphosids. Theraphosids, I don't know. Found in all warm parts of the world, there are nearly 1,000 species. The smallest is no bigger than your thumb, but the biggest can span a large dinner plate with its legs. Yeah, we have tarantulas where I live, but they're they're probably about like this size in real life. They're small compared to like the big hairy tarantulas. <laughs> anyway, they're still a nuisance. Let's read the little facts here about venomous fangs. A little creepy, but I'm doing it. Spiders use their fangs to inject venom that disables their prey. Tarantula venom can be deadly to small creatures, but is usually no more serious to a human than a bee sting. Ambush tactics. Tarantulas ambush prey rather than trapping them in webs. The largest ones are big enough to kill small vertebrates. In this photo, two Peruvian tarantulas are feeding on a tree frog. Wow, okay. And let's look at the anatomy. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they're beautiful. I just don't want to touch one, you know. Hairy legs. All spiders have hairs or bristles, but tarantulas are hairier than most. Many hairs are touch-sensitive, used in detecting movement of prey. In American species such as this one, they are barbed to irritate and can be scattered in self-defense. Wow, that's interesting. It's the Mexican red knee tarantula. This little red knee's there. He's got knee pads on. <laughs> it's pretty neat. It says, Mighty Spiders. Tarantulas grow bigger and live longer than other spiders. In most parts of the tropics, they are high in the food chain, but their numbers are small wherever they live, making them vulnerable to habitat destruction. All right, let's see the different types of tarantulas. Here's the western desert tarantula, one of the largest spiders in North America. This desert species from Arizona and Mexico survives heat and drought by burrowing underground. Here's the little Mexican red kneed tarantula. Found in tropical hill forests, this species burrows into banks and around tree roots. A popular pet, it is now threatened by illegal trade. Yeah, I was gonna say that's the one that you see in like pet shops. Here's the one I don't want to see, the Goliath tarantula. It's kind of making my skin crawl a little, but I'm okay. The biggest tarantula and heaviest spider of them all lives in the rainforests of the Amazon basin has a leg span of 12 inches or 30 centimeters. Moving on, the Chaco golden Need tarantula. The Chaco is an area of extensive grassland in South America, south of the Amazon, and the golden Need is one of many tarantula species that thrive in this habitat. My pencil is squeaking there. Did you hear that? I kind of liked it. Anyway, here's the blue-footed baboon spider. Now, this is interesting. This one has boots on. This one has knee pads. This one has boots. Baboon spiders are ground-living tarantulas found in Africa. They get their name from their wide-tipped legs, which are said to resemble the fingers of a baboon. Very weird, but I like, kind of like those ones. This is the Indian tree tarantula. Anyway, one of the many species of climbing tarantulas, this spider with striking markings lives in tree holes where it mainly preys on large insects. And down here we have another one I don't want to meet ever, the Queensland Whistling Spider. Like some other Australian tarantulas, the whistling spider makes a hissing sound by rubbing stiff bristles at the base of its fangs to deter predators. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> oh, Australia. Some little facts. The oldest Mexican red knee tarantula is known to have lived for 28 years. My goodness. And it says Goliath tarantula fangs can grow up to one and a half inches or 3.8 centimeters. I don't like that fact. All right, let's move on from the spider page. Spiders are gone. No more spiders. We're on to the common starfish. Along with sea cucumbers and urchins, the common starfish belongs to a group of animals called echidnoderms. 
which live only in the ocean. Like many marine animals commonly spotted on or near the seashore, the starfish actually spends most of its life in deeper waters, as it needs to be underwater to spawn. Let's see the boxes. It talks about starfish larvae. Starfish begin their life as eggs, hatching into tiny larvae that drift among minute organisms called plankton, on which they feed. Older larvae, seen here, develop sticky arms that they use to attach to the seabed before growing their five adult spiny arms. Never really think about starfish babies, don't you? This says, mussels on the menu, which good, I like mussels too. The common starfish preys on lots of different invertebrates, but has a special liking for two-shelled mollusks, such as mussels. They pull the shells apart with their arms, then stick their extendable stomach through the opening to digest the meat inside. What a way to go. And let's look at the body up here. It looks textured, this picture. You can almost imagine you petting the starfish. Let's read about its spiny skin. Protective spines grow from small, hard plates just under the skin. And smell sensors. The skin contains sensitive chemical receptors that pick up the faintest smell of prey. You know, you don't really think of starfish as predators, huh? But they are. The Atlantic star. The common starfish is found along the Atlantic coasts of North America and Europe down to depths of 1,300 feet or 400 meters. When food is abundant, especially in spring and summer, they appear in huge numbers along these coastlines. I skipped one, I didn't see this. Simple eyes. An eye spot at the tip of each arm allows the starfish to detect light and shade. That's a wild fact. Ooh, that's really cool. Let's look at the map down here. So we're up here by Canada. It says ocean mixing. Starfish on North America's Atlantic coast are regarded as the same species as those in Europe. Currents in the North Atlantic help mix starfish larvae from both sides of the ocean. They're heading out. Wow, Mid-ocean realm by the Azores. A population of starfish lives among along the rocky shores, reefs, and sandbanks around the Azores, a group of volcanic islands far out in the Atlantic. Then up here by Greenland, we have the colder coasts. Common starfish cannot survive and breed in waters as cold as the Arctic, but warm currents flowing up from the equator help push their natural range north along parts of Greenland's coast. I don't really associate Greenland with starfish, but they're there. And Iceland, too. The Faroe Islands. Oh, I, there's another fact about its body. The many tiny feet. Like other echidnoderm, starfish move from place to place using tiny sucker-like tube feet. The underside of their arms is covered in hundreds of these feet, which bend from side to side to push the animals slowly along the seafloor. I have learned so much about starfish today. They have hundreds of little feet. They've got eye tips at the end of their legs. Absolutely wild. Let's go down here. This is like Southern Ireland, Northern Spain, to read about the colors. The skin of the common starfish is usually orange, but some are in shades of brown or purple. Up in the North Sea water, the North Sea is slightly less salty than the open ocean because many rivers flow into it. Common starfish still thrive here, even in river estuaries. Here we are in the Baltic Sea. The common starfish is one of the few echidnoderms that can survive in the very low salt levels of the Baltic. And up here to the Norwegian fjord. Norway's long coastline is carved by narrow, deep inlets called fjords. The muddy and sandy bottoms of these coastal habitats are full of common starfish. And up here it says, Northern Delights. Even along the Kola Peninsula, above the Arctic Circle, warm currents keep waters ice-free, 
hear starfish feed on the plentiful scallop beds. They have such a wide range, don't they? Let's read one last fact, and I feel like it's like the most known starfish fact, to be honest. If one of the starfish's five limbs is severed, it simply grows one back. Boop. Anyway, that's going to be it for tonight. Next time we read this book, we're going to read about fish. <laughs> so thank you very much for watching. I do hope you found this video relaxing and educational. I do hope you were relaxed. I got a little tense during the spider parts, but it's, like I said, it's still really interesting, right? Did you know that there are spiders in Africa with blue feet? Now you do. <laughs> thank you again. Have a very good, 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 good night.